Stanford University. Good afternoon. Uh, we're well into the quarter. I hope that those of you who are taking the class AA380 for credit are doing your reviews incrementally instead of patching them up for the end. Uh, success seems to be correlated with incremental instead of batch work. Um, there's an this is an engineering seminar, and engineering is about trade-offs, as we've mentioned before. Good, fast, cheap. Pick two is, the is one of the traditional rules of thumb, and we've established the price of a, of a browser free. Um, unfortunately, up till now, we've, we haven't gotten good or fast. <laughs> so that sort of seems wrong. Um, people, lots of people are working on fast. However, um, one of the more famous or least considered statements in the last dot-com boom was, we're going to turn Windows into a set of poorly debugged device drivers from a company that inadvertently distributed more viruses and other sorts of security problems than anything in the history of mankind. Um, well, we're trying to do something about that now. Well, actually not we. Uh, today's speaker, Chris Greer, uh, Greer uh, has been working on an approach to Make browsers something you can actually trust instead of something you run inside a sandbox on somebody else's computer in hopes that it doesn't mess up yours. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me out here today. So I'm going to be talking about the Gazelle web browser. Uh, and this is work that I've been doing with a number of other people. Um, Helen, Alex, uh, slides? OK. Uh, Helen, Alex, Sam, uh, Piali, and Herman. These are all the co-authors on the tech report that was released uh, mid-February. And um, there's actually going to be a oh, okay. new version um, of this paper coming out. Uh, it'll be appearing in the fall. We'll have a, a new camera-ready version of that out soon, too. Um, slides don't seem to be up there. Is it back? Yeah, it's up here on the TV. <coughs> I see it on the little TV. Yeah, I know. Um, if you go into the display thing, you can go check in here. Make sure it's set right. It was working just five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Oh, it's on the little TVs up there, though. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, okay. It's warming up. All right. Okay. Yeah. We'll go back to the other one. <laughs> Is that looking better now? All right. We'll start it again. Okay, so um, so as I said, I'm going to be presenting the Gazelle web browser. This is work I did at Microsoft Research in Redmond. Um, and there's a tech report out now. Uh, the source code is, of course, still um, being held tightly by Microsoft. Um, and uh, maybe we'll see some, some demos and, and stuff when we present in the fall. So why I'm up here talking about web browsers is um, because browsers have really become an application platform in the past few years. Um, we've seen you know, applications from maps, banking, email. You can watch videos, get all your TV. Pretty, pretty much anything and everything is out there and hosted with the browser as the, um, the application platform. And a lot of the application uh, state that is associated with various applications around the web is, is pretty sensitive. So you know, we have banking apps and we have TV apps and you know, your credit card numbers, your banking statements all appear in the application state associated with 
um, with, with these applications. And um, the underlying um, browser now has to be able to kind of partition resources and make sure that you know, your banking statements aren't mixed up with um, you, know, you watching TV or, or maybe even worse, you know, navigating around to places that have maybe evil intentions or are overtly malicious. So underlying this, uh, underneath the browser, uh, we kind of see the browser accessing a number of different uh, application resources that we saw with kind of traditional desktop applications. So display, memory, file system, et cetera, et cetera, those, those kinds of things. We also have network resources, which are treated a little differently in browsers. Um, we have third-party scripts, um, so third-party scripts and images that come from different locations than maybe where you might have navigated to originally. And the browser is really failing to provide uh, protection between different resources on your computer. And uh, in addition, you kind of see this manifested by all these exploits um, that have been coming out in, re in, re in previous and re very recent history. And these attacks are much more damaging than they need to be. So rather than, you know, a, uh, a TV application simply, you know, exploiting itself and going off and running on its own, you know, the whole browser state is now at risk. And sometimes even um, your underlying operating system state, so your personal documents are also at risk um, when we have these application or with these uh, browser applications uh, exploited. So our solution is to uh, redesign the browser. And with Gazelle, um, we want to design the browser as a multi-principal operating system. And we're going to protect the resources that the browser is allocating to different applications, uh, such as persistent state, network, memory, screen, um, all built on this idea of the browser as an operating system. And the goal here is to get some security through this design. So we want to make sure that you know, if, if one, one application is, is successfully exploiting a hole in your browser, that um, it's, it's not accessing other resources that it shouldn't be accessing. So the protection of, of resources in a multi-principal browser-like operating system is, is now very important. And um, we can ensure that these things happen by designing the browser correctly. We also want to address real threats and the, and the need for protection. So, you know, with these examples, we have things, you know, where you have one tab open and a tab open to a different place. And one of these, one of these instances could be entirely, entirely malicious. The page can be constructed with the intent of exploiting your home machine or your, your browser. And, and, you know, running right alongside this is the most sensitive information you have possibly. You know, maybe you're, you're like transferring money from one bank to, or from one bank account to another. And these happen right next to each other. And the browser provides really no underlying protections between these two. So, and we also have this idea that the browser has persistent state. So we see this with, you know, cash, cookies, and various other things. But um, credit card numbers, social security numbers, emails, and authentication all appear um, sometimes in cached values and cookie values um, laying around for um, attackers to later harvest. So the outline for the rest of the talk, first we'll go over um, kind of uh, browser architectures as they are today, um, including uh, recent browsers like uh, Chrome and uh, I Internet Explorer 8, which just came out about a month ago. Um, we'll talk about the Gazelle architecture and how it differs from the, the other browser architectures, as well as um, modern browser security policy. And this is kind of a quick overview of, of what's out there today and what the security policies look like, um, specifically how Gazelle tackles security policy. And um, one interesting aspect that we put in the, in the tech report is this idea that um, we have uh, some sort of display security being offered by Gazelle. So um, whether it's like a trusted path-like interface or um, some sort of um, security being offered in terms of the pixels that are actually presented to people on the screen. Um, we also have some performance numbers and some implementation details at the end. So as far, to, as, far as building web browsers goes, kind of have this idea of what's out there and what we have to be able to deal with. And um, you know, we're not going to reinvent uh, you know, HTML or JavaScript in this case. We, we know that we need to kind of coexist with um, a lot of the standards that are out there. So that this means you know, parsing and rendering HTML, executing JavaScript, handling CSS, and doing all these kinds of things that you expect browsers to do today. Um, and this includes especially running plugins and images, as well as many, many other standards that exist out there today. Um, something that's recent that has come up um, more and more uh, is this idea that we're going to have single applications that aggregate content from uh, many different sources. So, you know, whether all these sources are trusted or not um, is, is kind of dependent on the application. Um, but we have very simple uh, examples of this which with image sharing. So if, you know, my homepage links to an image at Stanford site, you know, I can just simply include that image, grab it, include it, and now that, you know, image is rendered alongside everything else. We have these kind of other extremes where we have mashups where 
executable content is actually being used. So I include a piece of functionality from somebody else's site or a piece of functionality that they want me to include possibly um, into my site in order to get that, that code executing um, alongside everything else I have. And these kinds of things are really what's driving um, a lot of the, the applications that we see today. Um, and the goal in building a new web browser is that we want to be able to handle all these kinds of existing cases while providing security where we can. And previous browser architectures kind of fall into two, two categories. We have this idea of a monolithic or a single process uh, architecture like Firefox in this case. So all the content from um, all providers. So regardless of the number of tabs open, whatever you're doing, everything's running in kind of the same protection domain um, on top of your operating system. Um, and the way they kind of manage security in, in, in this context is by having security checks throughout their code. So they have to anticipate the way that functions are going to be called and control flow happens and, uh, and put the right checks in the right places. So the problem with these kinds of architectures is that, you know, one bug kind of voids a lot of the security guarantees that you tried to hand code in there. Because we have code execution attacks, buffer overflows and whatnot that can, um, you know, jump around and kind of uh, place a little bit of... Um, uh, remove a lot of the, the security che checks that have been put in there by the developers. So, and this kind of, these kind of architectures are seen in all commercial browsers except for IE8 and Chrome. Um, IE, IE8 and Chrome have um, a multi-process architecture um, where we take different content, it depends on the scheme, but we take content from different, different places and we put them in different operating system level processes depending on some internal policy. So, um, the kind of fundamental part of IE8 Chrome and another browser OP which I worked on um, is that they all have this idea that there's a browser kernel that underlies all of the processes that handle rendering your content. So, and this, this kernel is really in charge of, of managing resources um, in, in, a, in a kind of a, a primitive way. So we want to be able to, you know, open up new tabs while we spawn new processes, things like that. Um, and uh, again, OP Chrome and IE8 all have architectures like this. They do have different policies, and I'll actually talk about um, briefly about them now. So the OP web browser is one that I worked on um, about, about a year and a half ago now. And um, the goal here was to contain, prevent, and recover from browser-based attacks. So we're specifically interested in, in like execution, code execution style attacks that, that are targeting the web browser. And um, so our approach to do this was just, it was simple. We're going to divide the web browser up into subsystems and let the operating system um, kind of handle the protection of processes for us. And we have, you know, page-based isolation. So every page you view is a new set of processes. Um, so if you have 10 tabs open, you have 10 sets of these processes corresponding one, one set for each page. Um, and then the browser kernel is really just a message passing system system at this point. You know, it enforces access control on passing messages from one process to another, um, and it labels processes according to a security policy. And the security policy can vary depending on, um, on, on some, some things we, we said in the paper, but if you're interested more in that, there, the paper was published last year at uh, IEEE Security and Privacy. So um, some problems with architecture, with, uh, with the OP architecture, was that each page is, re is responsible for its own display. So if we have, um, if we have a page with um, aggregating content from multiple sources, the content is all rendered by, in, in the end, one process. And so the kind of question here is, can we provide more security for display properties? And, and we did this with Gazelle, actually. We also noticed that we have some processes in OP that really aren't providing a lot of security um, and are um, introducing overhead in terms of the IPC cost. Be okay. I don't know what's happening. Like I think the projector is having some issues. Okay. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Do I have to do I have to do anything for this? Huh? Do I have to do anything? Are you at that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, the kind of problems we saw with OP were um, that. There, there's minimal security guarantee. There's minimal security offered by separating, for example, the JavaScript parser or the JavaScript engine from the rest of the HTML operation, because the the content is really being provided by the same en the same the same uh, same domain and the same entity in this case. And really, we have we have maybe fault tolerance, but we're just kind of introducing a lot of a lot of IPC. So for very JavaScript heavy pages where there's lots of interaction between JavaScript and HTML, there's going to be a lot of IPC there. And IPC, of course, there's, there's always a cost associated with, the, with these kinds of things. So um, the kind of thought was, you know, we, maybe we can, we can do better. Yeah? Well, how much, 
<coughs> in, in OP, how much are you getting from having it all be one process as opposed to something you could do on a, on a Unix-like system? I think it's harder you know, on Windows. You could actually have multiple separate processes for each of the browser pages. Um, uh, do you actually use, is it one process, and what are you getting out of it being one process? So with OP, we actually had four processes for every web page, um, four operating system like Linux processes. So, um, and this was because we wanted to be able to isolate components and contain exploits inside of every, so HTML parsing exploit contained in the HTML parser, you know, code execution is limited there. It also gets us a little bit of benefit when we do um, like sandboxing, because we can, we can use SE Linux and other sandboxing techniques to like really tightly control each process individually, rather than having like per page or per browser kind of policies. So does that answer your question? Okay. So I know you guys can't see the slides, but <laughs> um, okay. So, <laughs> so there we go. So, so this is the next slide. Oh, it's coming back. All right. So we should go through them real quick maybe, but <laughs> uh, um, okay. So, <laughs> so um, the next two browsers uh, we're going to talk about quickly are, are Chrome and IE8. And both of these also have an idea of this kind of browser kernel as some sort of management um, for, for web page instances. And the way they divide things into processes in ter terms of running on top of the browser kernel is, is different. And they have different goals when they do so. IE8's primary goal was plug and fault tolerance. So they, they took a bunch of their n numbers and found out that um, ActiveX controls were something like 70 to 80% of all browser crashes that they were seeing. So they were like, okay, well, let's just simply you know, provide processes for this and now we have um, basically some sort of level of fault tolerance for our browser is ActiveX, you know, can crash one tab and the rest of the browser just keeps going. Um, so Chrome also has um, a process per tab model. They have a few others too that, that, they, that they've actually, um, there's a tech report out from them too, so um, where they discuss some, some, some of these things. Um, but with both of these, we still have embedded content coexisting in the same process. So if you have a malicious page that embeds your bank into a, let's say, a frame or something like this, we still have the, the mixing of the content inside of a single process, which um, from the perspective of maybe the, uh, you know, uh, of code, code execution types of attacks can, can still be kind of dangerous. And it's also not clear that the, that the kernel, and, th and this is for, for both IE8 and Chrome, but that the kernel is providing the right layer, of, or the, the right abstractions for isolating content inside of a single page. So this is kind of the, the problems. Again, they, have, they had different goals going into this. Um, so this isn't really you know, a, a fault of theirs, but more so just kind of observations we can make after the fact. Um, you know, they, they're going to get great results with um, you know, containing plugin exploits and containing plugin faults, and, and, that, and that was their goal here. So. Um, so next slide. Okay, we still got slides. Okay, so the goal with Gazelle is to build the browser like an operating system and make the browser kernel responsible for all security decisions made inside of the browser. And here we want, we're going to isolate web principles. So going back to the operating system analogy, um, we have this idea of a, of a principle in an operating system and we're going to align the principle boundary inside of Gazelle um, with um, the origin on the web. So I'll define origin in, in a couple slides, but um, this is kind of the, the core architecture of Gazelle here. Um, so what Gazelle really is, is a browser-based operating system with mediated sharing. So we provide the strong isolation and then we provide um, basically message passing and message patching inter interfaces between processes to accommodate for sharing on top of this. And uh, when we do this, we're trying to get a consistent policy across browser resources. And again, this goes with, you know, from persistent state to uh, display sharing, uh, we want to have some idea of of how to map this into an operating system analogy with the principle as the origin. Okay, so the Gazelle architecture uh, looks something like this. We have per origin processes that are sandboxed. And um, as you can see up here, we have two processes for each origin. We have a browser instance and a plugins instance. And um, so every time you open a, a new tab or a, a new session to a different origin, uh, we'll create a pair of processes that then um, is, is, is running. So in this case, we have a tab open at Microsoft and a tab at Stanford, and we have two pairs of processes to manage, to manage all the content running on those two pages. <coughs> and these instances interact with the underlying browser kernel through a set of Gazelle system calls. And um, the browser instance that you see up here is really, um, we, we call it kind of the, the libc for the web. Um, but what it's doing is kind of masking the system calls from the JavaScript and the HTML that's running on top. Um, so 
the, the libraries have been modified, or the, the, the libc or the libc for the web has been modified such that it makes calls into, into the Gazelle browser kernel whenever it needs to manage resources or interact with the underlying resources. And so it's kind of masked from the web application. Um, and this just, this just, you know, it simplifies it from the point that we don't have to require pages to change their design simply to accommodate a new architecture. Um, so the browser kernel here um, manages all access to those system resources. So, you know, we have um, display, network storage, as well as IPC. So processes can talk to each other, and actually there's going to be new standards coming out in whenever they come out, I guess, years maybe. Um, but that kind of accommodate for um, inter-process communication as well as uh, inter-site communication in terms of post message is the common um, referred to API. But, um, and again, this is all living on top of um, a, a modern operating system. In this case, Gazelle is built on top of Windows Vista. So, so browser security policies today, um, there's really no one policy that's out there for your browser. Um, we have different policies depending on the type of resource that's being managed. So we have for, uh, the, the most commonly referred to one is, is the JavaScript same origin policy. And this is kind of used a lot in terms of um, uh, for a, a lot of different um, research these days. But the general theme with same origin policy is that objects of one origin cannot access objects of another origin. It's a pretty simple non-interference non policy. And we define an origin by um, you know, a protocol, a domain, and a port. Uh, I don't know if the colors are coming across. They kind of do. So you know, we define HTTP, research.microsoft.com. Um, the HTTP protocol, research.microsoft.com is the domain. And the port's on the end there. It's port 80. Um, port's assumed in most cases, so it's, it's still there. Um, and this is the policy that governs basically all JavaScript, all JavaScript execution. Now, when we talk about persistent state, we're interested in what happens with cookies for the most part. Um, and cookies have a different type of policy applied to them. We have a, in addition to the origin, we add on some other constraints. We add on the path, and we add on um, a few other things, such as you know, was it SSL and and a, a additional parameters. Um, according to a cookie, there's actually an RFC for this one, um, but it, it's a, it's a, it's an additional policy that browsers implement. So recently, um, we also have this idea that uh, we have navigation in browsers, and we can have um, frames navigating other frames and vice versa. So um, the kind of policy that has been, uh, that's, it's kind of all come together in about, it's been about a, about a year and a half or two years now, I guess, um, is, is called the descendant policy. And I think a couple authors from one of the papers that coined the term are here today. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so yeah, so. This is the, called the descendant policy. And the descendant policy is, is, is different than the other two policies in that it's, it's origin and URL blind. So regardless of, of where the content came from, um, we provide the, the descendant policy says how to allow navigation. And then if we start talking about plugins and plugin security policies, there's really, you know, there's really no way to talk about plugin security policy correctly here. Everybody implements something different, and it's up to the plugin developers to actually implement security at all. Um, and in some cases, you see um, you know, fairly well-defined security policies, such as the Adobe Flash player and Silverlight have, have fairly well-defined ones. Uh, then on the other extremes, you, know, you have peer-to-peer -peer video players coming from some random person that just wrote one one day. And there's no guarantees of any security, let alone um, that exploits and that the content is contained properly and won't damage your system. Um, so. Uh, you see kind of the interactions of th these things end up being kind of fun. So um, if you have pages that include Flash, you can get around same JavaScript same origin policy pretty easily if you're willing to include a small Flash applet. So you can kind of defeat different policies in different ways by kind of combining the features you want. And this is kind of an, an, interesting, uh, an interesting evolution of this is um, one of the features of JavaScript is that it allows for asynchronous network requests to happen while the page is executing. And uh, this, is, this is done with the uh, XML HTTP request objects. And so the problem with this is that JavaScript is limited by same origin policy. And a lot of people that write web pages like to, might want to make requests to different origins. So what do you do? Well, you include a, flash, a little Flash application that simply directs you. Uh, you can make calls in and out of Flash with JavaScript. And um, you can get around same origin policy by calling into a Flash applet that will then proxy the calls for you. Um, so it's, it's pretty simple to do, and um, it's actually kind of the recommended way. Um, and these Flash applications, you know, they don't take really anything special to, um, to develop these, these kinds of things. So um, in terms of display policies, we don't really have a, a well-defined display policy for browsers. 
uh, we have this idea that um, you know when we have frames and and parents or, uh, parent frames including child frames on a page so if you go to your iGoogle page for example you have gadgets that might be contained in iframes um, the kind of gen general principles here are that whatever's contained in an iframe shouldn't break out or shouldn't be able to draw over the, 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 the content that's being included and we don't really have a, a very formally specified way of doing this or what other properties we might want out of a system that does this. So Gazelle's security policy takes the unit as the origin of isolation. So um, this is really the primitive for all Gazelle security policies. And we apply this across all resources. So for example, um, the, the cookie policy, which is a slight modification of, um, of, of same origin policy with some added added uh, features is underlined, under, underlined is implemented with the same, the same primitive. So we have you know, local storage as an origin isolated kind of bin that you can write to. Um, all right, well, <laughs> turn off again. But um, so the or origin is kind of the, the un underlying primitive for um, all, of this, all of the security policy in Gazelle. And this kind of gives us kind of a common policy that we can just kind of apply across all resources now. And this also simplifies the kind of implementation of the kernel that's underlying all this, because the kernel is where all the security policies are going to be enforced and where the policy is actually specified. So the goal here is that we want to be able to uh, enforce security policy even when, um, even when one of the principles is, is, is exploited. So if you know, Flash Player has, a, has the latest exploit you know, being targeted by some people, it's contained inside of it. And really, its accesses are limited to the same accesses that it could have performed before it was exploited. This also lets us kind of minimize the trusted computing base by moving all of the uh, all of the security logic into the browser kernel. We don't have to trust the HTML parser or the JavaScript engine anymore. We can just kind of assume that you know it, it does whatever it wants, and as long as the browser kernel is 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 not exploited, we're we're pretty much safe. So the examples aren't going to work this well, but so we'll talk about uh, next about isolating content in Gazelle. So kind of a, the interesting aspect of, of web pages is that we can combine content from a lot of different sources. Uh, so this is just an example YouTube page. Uh, the URL is up there. It's going to be probably impossible to read now. But um, so there's kind of a few components that make up these pages. And you know, there's, there's a really big component that, you can, that, that you, you can see right in front of you. And, that, and that's the Flash video that's actually playing the video content. Um, and that's actually not hosted by YouTube. So the URL you enter, OK, back up, OK. So the so the, the the URL you enter in this case uh, is is YouTube.com and it's got a it's got a page that lets you watch this, this video, um, and in this case the plugin content is actually coming from s.ytimg.com um, instead of YouTube. So YouTube has linked to content at a different domain uh, simply for providing the, the, this video. There's also an iframe um, that provides uh, this advertisement. This one's coming from DoubleClick, I think, um, and it's the can't really read it, but I think something about a closet sweepstakes. It's right up there on the side. And then we have kind of the HTML content and the rest of the text uh, for the page, which in this screenshot is actually probably not the majority of the content. But um, another type of content we see here is the images that are displayed. Um, so the images come from yet another domain, in this case, uh, i2.ytimg.com. Um, and so this single page is made up of content from all over the place. And all this content is kind of composed into a single page by your browser. And what Gazelle is going to do is isolate the content appropriately and provide uh, mechanisms for sharing on top of that. So we have two different ways of combining content in Gazelle. So the first is this idea where we um, allow JavaScript to run as the including domain. And the kind of run as means that when we run this content, it's given permissions associated with a certain domain. It means it can access you know, resources according to that domain. So cookies according to YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so all the JavaScript included in that YouTube page is run as the including domain, in this case, YouTube. Other content is run as the providing domain. So when we have, we have a Flash video and we have an iframe and some images, they're, they're run as the principle that um, is being labeled in their, in their URL. So um, the, the ad is run as double click, the, the videos are run as ytimg.com, and all that kind of stuff is kind of split up and isolated, uh, isolated like that. Um, and all these, all these uh, different pieces of content are given privileges associated with that origin. And uh, we called this provider domain policy before, um, and, and that's just, just for consistency here. 
So as far as what it looks like, um, that same page kind of partitioned up is the four different things that I broke out earlier now have different instances. Um, so we have JavaScript and HTML from YouTube, has its own browser instance on the, on the left there. We have the plugin from one, uh, from one domain. We have images from another and an iframe from a, from a fourth here. So, and what the browser kernel is gonna do is combine all of the content now from all these sources and render a page that looks just like that one. Um, and it's not only going to combine the actual rendering process when it, you know, so each, each component renders to the browser kernel and the browser kernel combines the rendering, but it's also going to give each one of these permissions associated with the domain that's, that's labeled up here. So the iframe can, you know, save cookies according to double click and, you know, make XML HTTP requests back to double click like it should. Um, the plugin can access according to JavaScript and HTML from the other places. So as far as the display security in Gazelle, so our goal with um, kind of looking at display security was to provide the same kind of strong isolation, um, but now for rendered content. So with this division into different operating system level processes, we get strong isolation in terms of the memory contents between, um, between domains or between content from different origins. Um, and we want to have the same level of security guarantees for actually rendered content. And so the idea is to compose content from many different sources, and we have to do this securely, and we also have to do it pretty quickly. Um, and make sure that when we do it, we make the page look the same as it was, you know, it should have, should, should have been done. So the problems here are that we don't have quite as clear decisions as traditional operating systems do. And as we saw in the, the YouTube example, these pages are the, the kind of composition of content from many different sources is very inherent in the way pages are structured and designed. So you might not see, you know, Microsoft Word running on your desktop, ripping images out of Firefox, you know, to use all the time, but you do see this on the web. And this kind of, you know, multi-principle access is, is very much built in. We also have difficult cases when we start talking about what policy do we have um, when we talk about so display. Um, we can have transparent frames, so transparent windows on top of others. We can have images and things under text. We can have layers and, and cascading style sheets. All these kinds of things raise you know, sometimes interesting security questions, especially in the cases of, of transparency. So what is display isolation in Gazelle? So here's another case. I mentioned this one earlier was the iGoogle case. This is actually, this is mine um, that I put together quickly. What we have here is a number of different um, gadgets kind of all on the same page. And some of these gadgets are contained in iframes. And so the question now is what level of, of isolation do we provide to um, the the parent, or the iGoogle page in this case, and uh, the gadgets in each, in, each, um, in each box. So we have four different gadget boxes that are hosted in iframes on this page, and then actually part of you, the, the Google chat window is also in an iframe, the context list is. So you can imagine where it might be desirable to say, um, keep one of these games, such as flood it from breaking out and you know, reformatting all of the Google page, or simply drawing over all of the Google page. Uh, it also is probably desirable to make sure that if, you know, if one of these is a banking gadget or something, that Google isn't interfering inside of it. So this is the kind of level of display isolation that we want to offer with, with Gazelle. And it's, it's more than simply um, controlling you know, di different buffers for different sets of pixels because the locations, the sizes, and the layout of the pages is, is affected by the window sizes and um, the parameters that go along with each window. So with Gazelle, we uh, introduced a term called delegation and a few, a couple other terms, the landlord and the tenant. So when we talk about the way that um, areas of the screen are delegated from um, one entity to another, we, we say that the landlord can delegate screen area to a tenant. And we tried to stick with um, real world terminology or terminology here. So the, the landlord is very much the owner of, in this case, uh, the, the window or a building in, or would be the, the real world analogy here. So, and the tenant is simply living inside. So what happens here is the landlord chooses an area of the screen and gives up its rights to, those, to, that, to that square. Um, and so in this simple example, we have you know, A.com is the landlord and has delegated uh, an area to B.com. And the delegation, the act of delegation has been exposed to the underlying browser kernel so that the browser kernel can now impose um, access control on the different parameters associated with Windows, as well as between crosstalk that has to do with, um, with the layout and the display of pages. So when, um, when a 
when an origin or when a page uh, specifies a delegate, we specify who, so who we're delegating it to, as well as the dimensions and the location of, of these frames. Um, and who is, in this case, um, a URL or an origin. So once we do this, we can determine accesses on window resources. So when we're talking, first we'll talk about display resources, and then we'll talk about some display policies. But um, in general, we want to, um, we manage all of the display information inside of the browser kernel. And so the, now the browser kernel can identify who's the landlord and who's the tenant in all these interactions and enforce whatever sort of permissions we need to enforce. We have four um, somewhat high-level goals here when we talk about managing display resources. And these are kind of go back to that um, iGoogle example um, to, to kind of see how, how they would apply. But simple example, we want to prevent the tenant from um, interfering in the landlord space. So that little, I, that little flooded game you know, shouldn't be able to draw over the search box on the Google page, just as an example. And this is actually something that is supported by, by most by browsers today. So this is a kind of a, a well-accepted um, well policy here. Um, and so this means not only that it can't modify the pixels directly, you know, reach in and change the color of them, but it also means that it can't move itself around. So if it could simply reposition itself on the page, it could, you know, mask another, uh, mask another element. Um, we also want to prevent the landlord from breaking in on the tenants area. And so this is, you know, restricting access to the display content. So the landlord in this case specifies the dimensions of, of the tenants area. So we give a XY coordinate, a height and a width. Um, and, you know, that specifies an area on the screen which we're going to delegate. And we want to prevent the landlord from breaking in. And this, this idea kind of comes from what happens when the landlord is completely malicious and the child might be benign in this case. So, you know, the the banking, I, the, your, your bank's in an iframe, and you know my home page is being being malicious today, and it's going to you know try and initiate a transfer or something like this. Um, so we, we want to make sure that it's not you know snooping on your bank accounts, reading things off the screen, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we also want to allow the landlord to set the location and the size. And the reason that this that this is kind of um, important is that the landlord essentially has to has to lay out its page, and in order for the um, the layout to kind of have this flow layout to it. We have to have some sort of size and in, in, in location after we've laid out the frame. And when we set this location, we then give it to the tenant as the delegated area. So another interesting aspect is, is the URL um, that's involved in the tenant. So um, the, when a tenant or when a, when a landlord delegates a frame to a, for a dele that delegates an area for a child, um, it sets a URL, and this URL contains possibly sensitive information. So, for example, as you, you know, navigate around from one page to another, um, if you go through a login process, there might be something contained in the URL um, at a specific time that's, you know, sensitive somehow. It could be a, a session variable, it could be, could be your password, it could be something else. Um, and these kinds of things um, are essentially property of whatever the content in the page is. So what we do is we prevent the URL from being leaked to both um, the tenant and the, the landlord in this case. So um, what that said was that we allow the landlord to write but not to read the contents of the URL. So drawing policies um, are a little bit different. Is Now we're going to look at exactly you know, what we mean when we say that you know, we can't interfere as well as what's allowed and what's not allowed in terms of drawing um, on the screen. So once the delegation has been exposed to the, to the browser kernel, um, we can kind of enable security policy to be enforced on, on accesses between the two. So we want to eliminate dangerous cases um, and provide some sort of protection for uh, the screen area that's being rendered by, by, uh, by, by Gazelle. So the existing browser policy is basically that uh, a tenant can't draw outside of its region. Um, what Gazelle's policy, uh, we called it the opaque overlay policy, is, includes that, that, that part where we say that the tenant can't draw outside. But we also remove transparency on cross-origin rendering. Um, and this is kind of a, so the, the kind of decision here was, um, was one, it simplifies how we do event dispatching because we don't have to guess at the intention of, uh, of users. And it also simplifies cases where um, we have, so, okay, so it simplifies event dispatching because, okay, <laughs> we're, done, we're done, down at the bottom here. So <laughs> Gazelle's opaque overlay policy essentially takes um, cross-origin content that's being overlaid and says that it can't be transparent. Um, so, so this is a, a deviation from, um, from the standards and the, the way the current web operates. Um, but we kind of viewed this as a, is, it was a kind of a trade-off here, is 
we can simplify the case for event dispatching and try and provide this like trusted path-like experience. So when, when you type into a box, you know that the box is owned by, the, the thing you're typing in is actually what you think you're ty typing in. So you could mask this with, for example, a transparent iframe can be overlaid on top of a password box, and you'll actually be typing into the top one while the underlying one is, you know, is kind of doing what it should be doing. And, and these kinds of things come up. Um, we didn't set out, you know, to like stop these kinds of click jacking type, type of attacks, uh, you know, explicitly. But um, there's a few simple things that that we can do that, you know, that, that that might help in this aspect. So let's see. So as far as an example um, that kind of puts it all together. So this is kind of a, an example that involves a few different iframes. Um, so the top level browser instance in this case is going to be pointing to. Um, Let's just say it's, it's my, my domain. Um, and what it's going to do is we're going to kind of, you know, we get the content, we start parsing, and we encounter an iframe. And the iframe's pointing to live.com. And when we see iframes, um, delegation happens. So when delegation happens, you know, we're basically taking another browser instance and, and rendering the content inside of this window. We do that for live.com. This is kind of an un unrealistic example, but maybe they also have an iframe pointing to Google. Probably not likely, but. Um, so you can have further delegations. So you know the the the, the top level landlord delegates to live.com. Live.com is now the landlord for its area that can further delegate down. And so we see that you know you can basically have recursive delegation and the browser kernel handles putting it all together in the end. So the delegation is enough information for the browser kernel to reassemble what the page should look like uh, after we've done all of these steps. All right, so. The Gazelle prototype was implemented in C-sharp. Uh, we used a lot of the .NET framework to do this. Um, the browser kernel is a separate process than the rest of the rendering processes. It's around 5,000 lines of C-sharp right now. Um, so each one of those, the browser instance, the plugin instance, and the browser kernel are all separate processes and run um, all on top of the .NET framework right now. The display management, so the, the aggregation of all this content from different entities, is done using graphics libraries um, uh, as part of the .NET framework. The rendering that we do right now for um, the rendering and management of HTML and JavaScript is done with Internet Explorer based um, code right now. And there's actually an interposition layer that surrounds the IE object to, um, to keep it from accessing resources directly. So we want to make sure that whenever it you know, makes a network access or tries to access the, the display that it goes through the proper channels and goes into the, the browser kernel to do this. Uh, this kind of allows us the benefit that um, the browser can render pages just like IE could. Um, and has many of the same um, features and uh, quirks that IE has, I guess. So, and the browser kernel is again implementing all of the security policy for all of the browser, um, and it's our it's, it's our trusted computing base in this case. So performance numbers. So a few actions on the on the left side of the page, uh, just examples: browser startup, new tab, a new tab to a page, navigating from one page to another, navigating between domains. Um, so the kind of reason we chose these is these are just kind of typical actions and you can kind of see the effects of um, the process creation and the process allocation here is when you navigate from Google to Google slash ads, we don't do process creation because the origin has stayed the same. When we navigate from Google to New York Times, we have to do process, we have to create new processes and start up everything. Um, so there's a, there's a little bit of additional overhead in there. So um, it actually turns out that a lot of the um, a lot of the loading times are in the in the wrapper for IE because of some interactions with C sharp and uh, and in uh, C plus plus in this case, um, but uh, so that's up there now. Let's see what's next. I think so. In conclusion, um, kind of draw draw here is that building the browser as an operating system is a it's a useful construction for building browsers, um, and we can use a lot of the things we learned with operating systems in the past many years. Um, to kind of build browsers right. And using these OS designs enable, enable us to control resources. So we can control, dis, we can now control the display and the network as well as the file system and other, man, other resources that browsers interact with. It also gets a strong uh, isolation between objects of different origins um, as, as well as display isolation. So we can also do display management, um, which is something that browsers, other browsers really haven't um, broken into yet and provide strong isolation in uh, between content that's actually being rendered. Um, and hopefully we've shown that browsers can be resistant to web attacks by containing attacks inside of, inside of operating system level processes. And by providing a small trusted computing base, we hope that we can 
you know, be assured that our code is written correctly um, and maybe, maybe have some, um, use some other tools to kind of provide stronger, stronger assurances on a, a small subset of the code. Um, and, you know, we hope that we can prevent pr privilege escalation in the form of um, attacks in one browser instance exploiting those of another. Um, and I think that's all I have for today. So we'll open up for questions. Yeah. I'm interested in your uh, display delegation. In yeah. Particular, so like uh, uh, select drop down boxes? Yes. I was wondering how you handle that since those menus tend to escape the like, bottom of the browser. Window. Right. So um, this was actually, so we started off, we have this kind of opaque overlay policy, I guess, is where this kind of co comes in, right? Is this the instance where we have content being layered and you're wondering about select boxes over other people's content or? and then it has a select box with like a lot of items in it. When I click it, it'll extend over the parent, which seems to violate the... Right, so, so we started off with a very strict version of the policy that was basically um, no cross-domain overlays. And we moved towards this opaque overlay policy. So as long as that select box that isn't transparent, we don't have any problems with the rendering, I guess. It seems like it's the tenant who's been running over the... the lamp oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so actually, we are working... So we haven't actually... So right now, it, imp it implements it somewhat like, like I think you're, you're describing. It will draw outside of it. Um, so the select box will expand bigger than the way it's being drawn, or bigger, bigger than the frame that, 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 that it's in if the frame boundaries are smaller than the select box. So that, that's kind of what you're asking, right? So the, yeah, so th this is actually one, one part where we've had to kind of make exceptions with um, some of the, the way that the, the, some UI elements kind of work. We're working on providing, so we are actually working on providing different ways for handling those cases. Um, we don't have, so some of this, some of this we can't talk about today, but um, <laughs> there, there's going to be some, so some different ways of presenting the way UI elements are actually drawn on the page, um, basically because we're targeting smaller screens that makes things a little clearer. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so there, there were, there's actually, it's, it, the project has been continu continuing on after I, I left. I'm not sure actually what the current status of, of, of these th things is. With the opaque overlay policy, it is, it, it is a problem. So allowing elements, allowing UI elements to draw outside does cause a pro problem. And the first version of the prototype actually denied it. So the select box will be contained inside of the frame. And, and that does cause problems too because you lose compatibility sometimes when that happens. So, what? Oh, uh, I, yeah, I, I, have actually, I haven't looked at that one specifically, so, yeah. Has there been any work on, um, so we're moving more and more towards sort of same origin isolation, uh, but there are use cases where you really do need cross-origin communication and you need a secure vehicle accomplishing that. Is, that. is that addressed at all? Um, so um, we do provide um, the kind of page interaction kind of primitives like post message and Microsoft has its own like X domain message or whatever they're calling it these days. But um, they have kind of a version of, of both the network side of things as well as the page to page talk side of things. And we do provide this kind of masked over the IPC happening between processes. So these things have to be, in, in Gazelle, they have to be very explicit. So the browser kernel really has the right to mediate and to deny these kinds of communication channels. Um, though we kind of adhere to the way the policies are working right now. So with post message, you know, the, the, way, the, way, the, the way the access check, check is performed is really on the, the place you're posting to. Get to choose whether it wants to handle your message or not. Um, we haven't experimented with um, stronger policies because we haven't really seen a lot of standards that say one way or another which way to go with this stuff. Um, this is all part of HTML5, which could come out sometime. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, actually. Um, they don't have a date on it, so it's kind of, we, we, we don't know yet, I guess. What sort of implications might there be for providing a you know, robust, understandable cut and paste for, for users? Um, yeah, so this is actually one of the components that um, Gazelle does a little bit interesting is because the browser kernel is really managing um, the interaction between um, the, 
they, it's, it's really presenting the interface to the users in this case. So it's, it's, you know, it's composing the content that's rendered as well as providing the, the browser Chrome, so the, you know, the address bars and the start, you know, the go and all those kinds of buttons. So it also controls things like, like copy and paste. So the, the view that's presented of the page is actually, is actually, so if you would copy and paste, it would be isolated from the underlying page in this case, um, which has some, some combati combati compatibility cost to it, but at the same time, it's now managed by the browser kernel so that you could, uh, you could now apply a policy on top of this. You could say that you might not want to allow, you know, yeah, right, you might not want to be able to allow, because I, I think there was actually an exploit for this, right, where the copy and paste buffer was being misused by Flash or JavaScript or something like this. I'm, I'm not sure uh, how it works. But, um, but yeah, so you can now impose a policy on this if you if you were to choose to do so in the kernel. Yeah, in the back. Can you give a few other uh, compatibility issues that you've run across? I mean, the dig bar that Adam pointed out is one issue. Could you give like a couple of other interesting examples you've run, you've run across? Um, so, so yeah, so when we were testing, the display policies are probably the primary place where we see um, kind of interesting compatibility of questions come up um, so we did we did some testing with the tech report we, we put out some testing on numbers where we um, basically looked at a lot of the top few hundred pages um, to assess compatibility in terms of um, if we applied the strict policy where we said you know once it was delegated you could never draw over it versus this kind of opaque overlay policy and it actually turned out that um, the differences were, were very negligible in most cases is that most in, in, in all, Oftentimes, you could simply delegate once. So if the, the, the parent frame delegates a box to a, to a child frame, um, and it never would try to draw over that again. And we saw this a lot. Um, so this was actually an interesting thing, because if, if we allow, if we enforce a stronger property that says, you know, once the parent gives up rights to this box, it never can draw over it, during, at least during its lifetime, then um, you know, we have even stronger properties than we have with simple opaqueness, is that we know that you know, if evil site embeds bank and then draws over bank, we know that, you know, there, there's, there's still some questionable interactions there. With the, the no drawing policy, it's, it just can't happen. The bank's in charge of that area, and it always will be. Um, and this actually broke very little um, that, we, that we saw when we were testing, um, which was kind of an interesting result there. Do you remember what it did break? Um, so, yeah, so there were actually a few sites... Um, so there are a few sites, a few specifically were, were Chinese sites um, that had a lot of overlaid, a lot of overlaid elements. So there were transparent frames all over the place. There were transparent frames over plugins. There was um, all kinds of weird interactions going on that we didn't see anywhere else, which was kind of it was kind of interesting. Um, the one of them is QQ.com. I, I don't know if people are familiar with these things, but one of them was like QQ.com, and they're kind of like these aggregators that provide. Um, you know, news and games and everything all on one page. So just a lot of different ty types of mixed content and, and many layers and, and things like that. So, yeah. So as communications uh, applications become more prevalent on the web, your display problem really becomes a subset of a more general problem where, dis where, where you have rendering on the output side, which includes audio. And of course, you have your, your camera and your microphone. So you're going to see exploits where, you know, somebody turns on your camera, maybe you'll see a light, turns on your microphone, you won't see anything. Now, I know this is the Wild West, it's the domain of plugins, nonetheless, I wonder what thought you've given this. Yeah, so we've um, actually been given, given a lot of thought to plugin-related security. Um, so there actually was a doc, well, a proof-of-concept attack, very much like you described, um, for Flash, where they were able to demonstrate an attack that turned on the camera and the microphone inside of Flash and then, you know, spy on you while you're using your computer, essentially. <laughs> Um, which is kind of a um, a very dangerous a very dangerous case because it, it can be it's it's really underlying resource access is not being checked at all in, in these plugin case, in, in these kinds of plugin cases and so the question is now like we we know we can um, interpose on all of the plugin accesses it's just a question of what do you do once you start imposing on them um, and we have a lot of different policies that we can implement um, so Flash kind of has a very much like a JavaScript-like same origin access, but it doesn't really apply these things to directly to devices. Um, so you know you see this mostly in, in network accesses and page accesses um, rather than device accesses in general. But a lot of the problem we encountered when we were looking at um, microphones and speakers specifically was that 
the way you interact with them is more like sending buffers to them and then having them do something. Rather than being able to partition content and partition them into you know, origin-owned boxes, essentially. So um, right now, Flash and um, so we actually have, we had a version of this working. We have a version of Gazelle with Flash kind of uh, in it right now. But um, it, it allows access to those devices specifically because we don't have an origin bin, essentially, to bin these accesses into. Um, we have been looking at um, some policies specifically for the way they interact with pages that are much more detailed because we have a lot more information about um, elements and things than the way the pages are laid out. We can control accesses. You know, can ma maybe something like copy on write would be appropriate, where you know advertisements might not need access to you know your banking page while you're viewing your bank information. It might be safe to you know kind of just give them a, a dummy view of what's going on in the page, or um, these kind of like capability type models where you um, where the author of the page gives the plugin a set of capabilities that it can have um, is kind of one of those things that, that we've been thinking about. So. The user control over that? Mm -hmm. um, we could give the user control. Um, Turn off the ads. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, I guess you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the uh, ad, ad, ad people. <laughs> <laughs> Makes a lot of ad people angry. We can turn off the ads. Yeah. I was wondering how the uh, display management works with sites like Hulu, and YouTube that allow you to play videos full screen. Yeah, so we actually don't have with full. Full screen is something that we do not support right now uh, out of Gazelle. Um, this is something that we are working on trying to figure out, trying to find a solution for. Uh, we just haven't gotten one yet. So, For your look underneath your same origin policies, what are, what are the points of dependency there? I mean, there's one on integrity on the one yeah. addressing schemes. And right. what else? So we definitely do depend on, on, on DNS here. Um, we also depend on the browser kernel's ability to label processes correctly. So it has, to un it, it, it has to understand, essentially, um, parameters to syscalls and be able to parse, uh, you know, like an origin tag correctly. So it has to be able to parse the URL safely. Um, as long as the browser kernel enforces, is able to understand URLs and parse origins out of them in the right way, um, and DNS holds together, then we're pretty good in terms of um, being able to enforce the right labeling on top of that. So. Um, you use Stanford and Microsoft as examples. Do you go on the host level, or do you want the whole domain into one? Uh, it's, it's, it's entirely origin-based. So it'll use subdomains. So research.microsoft.com is different than Microsoft.com. Um, CS.stanford is different than Stanford in these cases, as well as between schemes. So HTTP and HTTPS are different in this case. What happens if somebody sets their document up domain to like Microsoft.com? Ah, uh, OK. Okay, so you probably read the tech report. <laughs> um, but so this is actually one of the cases that we um, we deviate from the standards again. Um, so JavaScript allows um, pages to uh, essentially set the domain that they're acting on behalf of for um, for some for some cases. So for example, research.microsoft.com can say, "I want to act on behalf of Microsoft.com right now," and and go up. So it can't go to can't be can't become Google, but it can become it can go up. So we can chop off parts of a domain. Um, we can't change them. Not up to com. Although there has been bugs that, do, that, that have problems with this because of international domains are like co.jp or something like that. Yeah, sometimes uh, two levels are kind of the same as our single level here in the States. Yeah, and, and that actually caused a bug in some browsers previously too. But, um, but yeah, so um, we actually don't allow this because of the labeling that happens in the browser kernel, we would have to essentially change the origin of processes now. And it's, um, it's not impossible to do. It's something we could do. We could roll content over from one process into another process. You know, something like checkpointing would probably be um, the, the right way to go. Checkpoint part of the process, package it up, unpackage it on the other end. We looked at doing this. Um, the problem is that these things can capture a lot of state internally before, they, before we roll them over. So we weren't sure how to do this safely right now. So we do not allow document.domain to be set to different domains. You can do it in JavaScript. It doesn't toss errors or anything. It just doesn't change anything on the browser kernel side. <laughs> yeah? This is kind of maybe ill-posed and very speculative, but say, are, are there any issues if you have very long-lived processes, like multi-year processes, like something like that, where DNS is kind of, you know, changing, <laughs> is changing out underneath you? And, and, uh, 
that'll be very interesting to look at, I think. Um, so the, the cases here is, so I think with, yeah, I think actually with Gazelle and especially with OP, we had a lot shorter lived processes than other, other browsers. Like Firefox has, you know, it, it says it's, it, it has state, you know, as long as it's open. So, and you know, you probably have to close it from now on, from time to time because of memory leaks and such, but um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I know with OP we saw, so because um, OP chose this kind of page, page level granularity, simply using the browser refreshes enough of these pages, enough of the processes often enough that it almost is better in terms of long, long run use because we don't have to worry about the memory bugs that, you know, inside of WebKit or whatever we're using to parse because you see them and you're like, okay, well, you know, the, the page is going to change as soon as you click on a link and we destroy those processes and create new ones. So you kind of get the recovery for free because the operating system will do the recovery of all that memory for you. <laughs> so. All right, I, any other questions? You're essentially creating guest, or managing guest users of the, from the outside. Is there ever going to be a privileged user from the outside? Hmm. Or a, a user with more <laughs> privileges? And what, is, what would that mean? <laughs> yeah. So, so far we've pretty much um, gone and, and like you said, applied resources or applied privileges pretty much uniformly across, across the browser without any sort of idea that one might be more privileged than another. I think if, if we do see this, I think it's going to be in the case where they're accessing resources that, um, like the microphone and the, like the microphone and the, the speaker for this case, where Pages are, are wanting more and more accesses to the underlying resources. And yeah, full screen, right, is, is another good case. And, and these kinds of things are probably where you'll see more authenticated or more trusted users than others. So. Or their HTML5 almost has, almost has a file system in it. So you can say, I, you know, this, is, this process gets to manage, gets to look at other people's files. Yeah, we, uh, we looked at um, kind of providing capabilities to, allowing pages to specify the capabilities that they're requesting. So if they want access to be able to full screen, for example, you know, a page could request that thing. It's just a question of now how do you, how do you choose to allow it? Or the flip side, my mom still hasn't figured out that there are accounts. And, the, you know, everybody harshes on their mother, but it's Microsoft's fault for not saying when unprivileged and on those special days, which should only occur on a Tuesday, three <laughs> four in the afternoon, you can install programs. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I mean there's definitely some kinds of um, services that provide at least what is a little more authenticated these days. We have you know HTTPS is kind of a more authenticated in some ways. Signed um, signed JavaScript is a little more trusted in sometimes than others. Um, you can actually sign JavaScript. So you can sign plugins. Uh, like like Java, Java executables. Right, this is kind of the, the flip side is the usability becomes a pretty big issue in this case is, do you want to allow this? Well, I have no idea, you know, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so, yeah. One more speculative thing. One of the things that always seemed to me the, a mistake that they made early on with Java and the way they designed applets was they tried to come up with one security policy for everything. And so they had to come up with one that was least common denominator and so they, forbade everything that might be a problem in any application. And there are lots of applications that you might imagine if you had the ability to design a security policy that applied only to one particular application. Then you could ask the user, is it okay if I run an application that lets any user anywhere on the net talk to this screen real estate while you're running this application? And then you might do some network game where other people could do whatever, you know, draw on whatever. And you wouldn't want to do that if you're also running your, your Quicken or talking to your bank or anything else. But there are times when you can set up yeah. uh, limited applications that you want to run that have a completely different set of restrictions on what you can do. And since you're doing a new browser, a new way of setting this up, did you try and explore any of the possibility of making different kinds of combinations of, of, uh, of, of features possible? So this is actually something we've been looking at a lot recently um, as since the tech report. Um, so I've, I've been, been looking very heavily into, you know, restricting. So, I mean, even inside of, you know, this, even inside of same origin policy, the cookie policies that modern browsers have, 
most pages don't use the entire range of their, you know, of their flexibility. So what we've been doing is restricting applications down to a very small subset of basically what they need and no more. And the kind of interesting aspect of this is, well, once you know what an application needs and just give it that, when an attack's introduced, so if, you know, user editable content, we kind of know now, okay, well, it wasn't doing this before and, you know, our kind of policy is already denying these things. So... Do you, do you learn that from some history about particular applications from particular origins or just watch an application as it goes along? Uh, so this is, well, so we actually have, so we don't have, um, this is something we're working on right now, so I, I don't have good numbers for, we, we're been, we've been evaluating both ways. So we have a couple of tools that have been collecting um, my browsing <laughs> for a very long time now, and uh, as well as other people in my, in my research group back at Illinois. And we've been kind of taking the browser history as a way to drive, um, drive that. Um, we also do have been looking at, you know, basically from just the navigation point. You open up your browser and you start browsing around. You know, can we converge on a policy that's acceptable fast enough? Like that's kind of one of the experimental points that we're trying to, trying to determine there. So. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very it's a very interesting question, I think, and definitely one that if if you can if you can have, if you have solutions for this, you prevent a whole range of attacks. You know, you you can start like breaking into cross-site scripting, request forgery, on top of just you know browser lo browser level exploits. So, okay. all right. Well, thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.